If you've been wondering what's the point of converting a ketone or aldehyde into to an acetal, look no further than this slide. In this video, we're going to discuss the advantages of acetals and how they're used in synthesis and to some extent in nature as well. The key difference between an acetal and a ketone or aldehyde has to do with the electrophilicity of the carbonyl or the acetal carbon. In an acetal, this carbon is connected by single bonds to two alkoxy groups, and each of these individually is a poor nucleophuge or poor leaving group, for the same reason that hydroxide is a poor leaving group. We've discussed that previously. What this means is that from the carbon's perspective, the carbon is not electrophilic. And as a consequence, it doesn't react, for example, when it's treated with a nucleophile in a nucleophilic substitution reaction. It's no longer acidic at the alpha position because these alkoxy groups are not electron withdrawing. And it pretty much doesn't do anything else under basic conditions. Acetals are resistant to bases and nucleophiles because the carbonyl carbon, the former carbonyl carbon anyway, is no longer electrophilic. The OR groups also provide some steric hindrance to that carbon, and this is a second reason why this carbon is not a great electrophile. Now, the other nice thing about acetals is that we can get back to the carbonyl group very easily. We've mentioned several times that the formation of an acetal from a ketone or aldehyde is reversible. If we want to go in the reverse direction from the acetal back to the carbonyl compound, we can do that by treating with an excess of water which served as a leaving group in acetal formation, and here, under hydrolysis conditions, is going to serve as a nucleophile. So in essence, what we're doing when we place the acetal in water and add a little bit of acid catalyst is driving this reaction toward the carbonyl side. And although we won't look at this mechanism in detail in this video, it's worth drawing out on your own using the idea that it is the microscopic reverse of acetal formation. Proton transfers in the opposite direction, and beta eliminations where we had nucleophilic additions and nucleophilic additions where we had beta eliminations. Keep in mind that nucleophilic addition and beta elimination are microscopic reverses of one another. One step is the other run in reverse. Now these two aspects of acetal reactivity, the fact that they're unreactive toward nucleophiles or bases and we can get back to the carbonyl compound fairly easily, form the basis of the use of acetals in organic synthesis as what we call protecting groups. The name is fairly suggestive, but the idea of a protecting group is that we're converting a functional group that would be susceptible to some kind of reactivity to something that is not. And what this allows us to do is retain this group through a synthesis even after a reaction where, for example, we've treated this compound with a strong nucleophile. Say, for example, we started with a compound that contained an ester and a ketone within it, something like this, and we wanted to get to a product in which only the ester side was reduced. So we wanted to get to a product in which we still had the ketone functional group, but the ester had been reduced to a primary alcohol. If we tried to simply treat the starting material with a good reducing agent, something like lithium aluminum hydride that would affect this reduction, this would not lead to this product, right? Because we would reduce the ketone as well as the ester. So instead of doing that, we need to use a multi-step process involving a protecting group. First, we treat the target with alcohol, let's just say R prime OH, and a little bit of acid catalyst to catalyze acetal formation. This converts the ketone into an acetal and leaves the ester completely untouched. We can then treat with LAH, and this will only reduce the ester since the acetal is not susceptible to reduction. It's not electrophilic. And then we can do what's called deprotection, converting the acetal back to the carbonyl functionality through acid hydrolysis, treatment with water and catalytic acid. And this is the reaction that you see on the left-hand side of the slide, this deprotection process. And what we end up with looks as if we had selectively reduced the ester in the presence of the ketone. What we really did was convert the ketone to something else, an acetal protecting group, and then reduce and then deprotect, convert this acetal back to a ketone. The reactivity of thiols with carbonyl compounds has some analogies to acetal formation. And so we can reason by analogy to readily understand how we can form what are called thioacetals, for fairly obvious reasons, this is an acetal with sulfur replacing the oxygens from carbonyl compounds and thiols. And this reaction uses alcoholic solvent, typically, which is 
Interesting, right? Because this would lead to the formation of an acetal in the presence of a Bronsted acid catalyst. And instead of a Bronsted acid, which would lead to acetal formation, we're using BF3. What is the mechanistic role of BF3? Well, if we look at its Lewis structure, the key to boron trifluoride is that it contains a central boron atom with a six electron building block. It's an electron deficient boron atom in there. And this is a Lewis acid. And so a Lewis base can coordinate to it. And this is what happens in the first step of the mechanism. Coordination of the carbonyl oxygen to that boron increases the electrophilicity of the carbonyl carbon. So if we actually draw formal charges here, we see that the oxygen is now positive and the boron is now negative. And this is analogous to protonating the oxygen in acetal formation. We now have a good electrophile, the carbonyl carbon, in the presence of a good nucleophile, the thiol sulfur. And after nucleophilic addition and proton transfer, we're at something that resembles kind of a hemiacetal, but the thio version, a hemithioacetal, I guess we would say, with now BF3 still coordinated to the carbonyl oxygen. Similar kind of reactivity where this CO bond breaks and we end up with some kind of BOH group as a leaving group results in installation of the second SR group and formation of the thioacetal. So this is highly analogous to the formation of acetals. It's just instead of using a Bronsted acid, we're using a Lewis acid, BF3. One interesting note about thioacetals that contain a hydrogen linked to the carbon bearing the two sulfur groups is that they're actually relatively acidic at this position. And so they can be deprotonated to form anions at that carbon. And what's remarkable about that is this is the former carbonyl carbon. Right? So this deprotonation turns a carbon that was electrophilic way back in the starting carbonyl into a good nucleophile, something with anionic charge. It takes a fairly strong base to do this, something like NR2-, but nonetheless it's a nice synthetic strategy for turning an electrophilic carbon into a nucleophilic carbon.